both both groups um, ended up um, going down the Arwa track, um, not by design, by kind of happenstance. And, and then so she, she became our principal archetype instead of having two different archetypes, which is fine. Um, things I like to highlight for the group in terms of what I think about when I, when I hear, um, when I hear these interviews with refugee students, is is there's two different abstractions. There's the there's the group of students who are deeply aspirational, such as Arwa. They they know what they want to do, right? They want to be a doctor. They want to be an astronaut. They want to be an engineer, right? There's they can they can pin their aspirations on a specific job, let's say, right? And then there's the other group in which it's um, it's a little bit more amorphous. It's fuzzier, um, more like Iteris. Iteris wants to kind of work with computers because he knows he likes computers, right? But but there's no definition on what does that job look like? What does that future look like, right? Both groups have dreams and aspirations of something more, more than what they currently have. Um, but But the gap is huge. The gap is huge between where they are now to where they want to go, right? Be it defined or undefined. So, so that's something I want to highlight for everyone here in terms of what we see and hear in the field. Um, another, another thing I think is also worth um, noticing and put into our kind of mind castle that was noted by the group yesterday is that there's a there's almost a little level of dissatisfaction from from us as um, as practitioners and um, and as people who runs and design programs in this interview process. And we can kind of get like one level deeper with the students and the interviewees that we have conversations with, but we can't get a lot more than that, right? And and this is a this is an occurrence frequently in the field, not just from us, but from, from many others. So, so the question is, why is that, right? And, and I think there's, there's multitudes of explanations, um, but also something worthy to consider. Um, why can we get deeper, right? Is it related to the archetype of Iteris where he says, I wanna work with computers, but I don't know what more? right? Um, it, it, does it sit in that general ambiguity space, right? Or, or is it the lack of trust? Or is it um, the, the lack of practice in articulation and being able to really say out loud um, and really being able to, to take us that far in, right? So then as practitioners, I think, I think in the insight empathy phase, we would need to consider going beyond the the standard interview protocol and more in the observation um, community building modality, right? To to really observe, to learn, rather than only to ask, to see, to confirm or deny, right? Um, so that's something I wanted to flag for us. So then, after the interview with uh, our archetype Arwa. We um, we mocked out a version of a uh, of choose your own venture, right? Um, if Arwa makes this choice, she is at a crossroads. She would go this way or that way, and then in which there's you know additional implications. So as the group walked itself through the um, the little choose your own venture component, we ended up with um, Arwa married, um, but wanting to continue to pursue her education and her development as a married person. Um, so then there is the formal and informal route. Um, more likely than not, she was gonna choose the informal route because it's less of a, the time constraint is a little bit gentler for, for a married person, a married young person. So then, which led us to the how might we statement.
Mohammed, will you read the how my we statement? Sure. Uh, so the final version um, we agreed on is how might we as designers co-create an informal educational path for young married female refugees in order to be complementary to her existing reality so that she can increase her self-esteem, financial support and social currency. So the outcome was threefold, right? Um, self, financial, and then greater social capital. That, that was the desired outcome. Um, then the group went back into work mode and um, in, in trying to generate a kind of brainstorm the first round of ideation and possible solutions. But it turns out we have more questions for Arwa. So then we went back to Arwa and asked her, um, asked her some more questions, right? Uh, which Mohammed will share here in a second. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, these are some of the questions that we uh, we had for Arwa. Uh, are there jobs or areas of work that uh, she has uh, seen in the community? Uh, of the work uh, or, or area of work that she wants to uh, to work in, uh, and we were wondering about the receptivity of the uh, co-creation idea. Um, what were what might be the challenges in the process? Uh, who are the biggest uh, supporters, uh, advocates, and the challengers in the community? Uh, if she likes to work online, offline, or with a community of women, for example, is there a, a specific mode for, for working or studying that she prefers? Uh, what uh, about her Wi-Fi also, we wondered, if she has Wi-Fi, or is there any power cuts in the camp? Uh, how much time does, does she have to, uh, to commit? Uh, for the process and uh, what are the motivations uh, for her to to study um, and well, um, on. yes I'm gonna stop yes. there. Um, can you stop screen sharing and we'll just do it as a whole we'll just do it as a group sure sure yes um so um I was hoping Sonia would be here today again because she plays such a convincing arwa um why don't um why don't Mohammed play the interviewer and I will, I will play Arwa and the rest of the room can um, act as secondary interviewer observers, right? And then we can talk about what we, what we heard. Yes. All right. All right. So um, Arwa, our <laughs> new version of Arwa, uh, are there any jobs or types of work that you have seen in the community related to science uh, since NASA or the space industry is closer to that? Uh, give me one second, I'm trying to... Um, I don't think I know anyone who works in such... Well, I don't think I know anyone who works in a job that's related to science. Mm -hmm. um, but I have a friend whose sister works as a lab assistant does that count? Well, um, she's still working in science, but not very close to what we had in mind. Um, all right, we'll, we'll move to the next question and uh, hear more from you. Uh, who is the biggest supporter or advocate and um, the detractors to, to you as, uh, as a woman um, or in, to the women's advancement in the community? Well, my biggest supporters are my sisters. One of them is two years older than me, and she's also married. And the other one is younger than me and still goes to school. Anyways, since I got married, my family doesn't have a say in what I should or shouldn't do. Um, my parents no longer voice their, their opinions or um, permissions. Um, I am my husband's responsibility, they say. My husband sometimes supports me, as long as the food is ready and I finish the house chores. If not, then he's not happy. And it's not so much about him, but it's his family who, who pressures him to, to make sure that, I guess he manages me well. Um, they challenge me sometimes, and it's mostly about how I manage the house. Um, in a community, women are looked down upon. They don't 
take important roles like being the community leader, um, which is called the mukta, or school principals, or, or really any jobs of significance. Right, that was really insightful. Thank you, Arua. Uh, so Arua, we know that you like to learn and study. Uh, how much time do you think you have to commit? Taking care of the house is not easy. I need to make food, I need to clean, I need to shop, I need to take care of my husband's family. I sometimes have some free time in the evening, maybe an hour or two, um, sometimes in the afternoon instead. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Um, so do you like to study in a specific mode, maybe online or offline or with a group of women or friends? Uh, and what, what type of learner are you? Working online can be challenging. The internet is not stable and the power cuts and, and it takes hours to come back online sometimes. Also, I like to go out and meet people face to face to learn together since I don't get to go outside the house that much anymore. Um, so any excuse to be outside is kind of nice. Um, my husband doesn't mind if I talk to other people um, or, you know, or if I'm at an event or, or, there's, or there's a reason to socialize. Okay, so um, and we heard from you back when you were uh, still in school and before you get married, but now what are your motivations and how do you like to be held accountable? I like learning. It makes me think differently and know more about life. I try to learn from YouTube and Facebook mostly, and I don't know what accountable means. Okay. Um, so can you envision yourself in a new real reality? And what, what is that? What would that look like in your opinion? I see myself as a more knowledgeable person, someone who can solve their own problems. Mm -hmm. For example, when there's a problem with my husband, I would know how to act um, for the best of us um, or, or help him or help advise him so that he can be the best. Um, I imagine myself working, even if not for NASA, but something that makes me, you know, feel like I'm making a contribution to science. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what matters more to you in this co-creating activity? It would be really great to find a good solution to, to both help myself and, and other women like myself, other young girls who had to marry early, such as myself. That'd be really neat. Definitely, definitely. Thank you, Arwa. All right, so that was that was a pretty realistic uh, round of conversation that we will have with our potential participants. Um, what did you guys hear? I guess one thing that struck me was compared to Arwa pre-marriage, her world has kind of shrunk. <laughs> that she used to be able to go to school, she had a lot of social interaction, her dreams were pretty big, and now she's, you know, much more in a very, very narrow lane. She still has some positivity, um, but it's it's often caveated with the constraints. For sure. And and there's and there's both psychological limits and physical limits. Exactly. Right. Yeah, it sounds like she sees the experiences that she's having and doesn't see actions with how that could even possibly um, be relevant in a place like NASA, even if that's not even a possibility or even if it is a possibility. You know, so just creating learning group or being excited about learning groups um, Sometimes it's hard for people to see what the roles could are in order as big and broad as a NASA. Absolutely, Janice. Um, there's, I think, part of the the gap that we hear in even before the second interview with Arwa, right? In in Arwa and Idris, is that there's all the steps in between is missing right? Like, what would you need to do? Like, what do you need to study in order to be NASA eligible, right? Um, so, and then also the lack of 
community role models, mm -hmm. right? Something achievable, something attainable, right? She couldn't look at, in the second interview, she couldn't look into her community and say, oh yeah, like so-and-so does a job in science, right? Like the closest thing that she could reach to was maybe a lab assistant, right? Yeah, it's sort of like there's no laddering. They have yeah. the reality and then they have the thing really far away and there's no laddering up to it. Absolutely. And almost zero visibility and even what that ladder even looks like. Exactly. Yeah. Anyone else? Um, I do think that 17 is young and to know deeply connections is, is, I don't know, it's, she's got some time to learn about connections and making those sort of creating ladders like that. I also noticed that um, accountability or accountable wasn't defined for her. Yeah, and, and from that, I would say that's more on us as interviewees and practitioners, right? Um, when I was answering as Arwat, I think the stacking of multiple questions within the same question perhaps is not helpful, right? A three-parter is confusing, right? Especially when it's a verbal conversation, right? Um, a little bit more sophisticated words such as accountability might just might just kind of skip them all together, right? But I think but I think those are techniques that as practitioners we can be conscious of an update. Okay, anything else? It's just the desire to like have opportunities within the social fabric of her community. Um, so others have remarked, yeah, her world seems a, a bit more closed. And so where are those opportunities to be interacting with other people within learning and how to fit that within her day, not just as an individual, but as part of a community? Absolutely. Um... So I think I'm going to give you a quick sidebar and then we'll move to the next activity. On, the, on this conversation of laddering and in zero visibility component, I was actually reading this article last night about, about critical thinking and problem solving. And, and the white paper was, um, it's, it's a behavioral cognitive um, science paper. And it's basically saying that um, we know how to solve problems by drawing from other sources and other samples that we've seen, right? So your input is as, um, as critical to your ability to solve and to navigate as, 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 and it, it, it dictates your output, if that makes sense, right? So this is kind of what we're seeing here with Arwen and Idris. They've seen doctors, they've seen school teachers, they've seen engineers, right, as examples in the abstract, but they've never seen the baby steps in between, both in terms of what they need to study and also what are related fields, right? Um, I'm, th there, there are many, many engineers and many, many people working on different parts of the space program besides the, the handful of astronauts that goes into space, right? But but the lack of visibility and the lack of exposure hinders, right? So in a, in a problem solving set and a critical thinking set, right? This is also hampering their ability to, to draw solutions that, um, that would be useful. Um, okay, so that was my sidebar. Um, <laughs> I hope it was helpful. Um, and so, now that we have a little bit more information from Arwa, right? Again, it feels a little unsatisfactory, but we, we did hear a little bit more. Um, I think maybe we refine our problem a little bit better 
and come up with a more focused problem statement. Hey, Charlie, one quick question. I don't know if the article mentioned anything about this, but um, because that, that definitely resonates from when we were out in the field and the kinds of aspirations that the students would have. But did it suggest, like, you know, if you're in a barren desert, like, how do you get the exposure to the, the impetus that gives you an idea? Like, is it just reading about it? That's enough? Or does it, you know, is it more like until the society around them has more examples, like they're going to be struggling? Like, or did it give you any, any input on that front? The article itself didn't. Um... But my, my guess is going to be that any solution would be more effective if the exposure is, is on all levels of experience, right? So they see something on TV, they meet someone in real life, they have a conversation with a potential role model, right? Um, a a pedagogical course outline of you need to learn X, Y, and Z, right? And here is here is how here are places in which you can go achieve such things, right? Because because a separate a separate tangent but related off of that same idea is that you don't know what the solution you don't know what to look for, right? As a solution, if you just didn't know. Right. So you don't know what you don't know. So if you don't know where to search, then it's needle in a haystack. But if you know which part of the haystack to look, right, which quadrant it is in which you're looking for that needle, then that's a different, that starts to be a different calculus. Right. Gotcha. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. One of the things that I brought forward um, in my day job is that you know? Can you imagine? So, can you imagine um, what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Budgeting for your household, um, you know, talking, you know, um, and encouraging your teammates or your, you know, your friends to do something. That those would be very important within any work. That these are important skill sets you're already learning now. That you know, can you imagine them being really important when they're trying? trying to put a person in space um, and they're like oh wow yeah you know and is there any part of that world that you really love doing oh I really love coordinating amongst you know my friends and you know identifying places to go okay really hone in on those skills that's really important see how that could be really important in a corporate setting so really making the connection with what they're doing, the importance of it, even though it might seem minimal, you know, not important to them, how that could be really valuable, you know, in a corporate setting. Absolutely, right? Um, and I'm so glad that you brought that up. Um, so both uh, Lorraine Charles's work at the mall and, and the actual work that we do at Hello Future is grounded in, um, in what's called 21st century human skills. Right, and they include things like financial literacy, media literacy, problem solving, critical thinking, um, and it goes on, right? The, what we find in the field is that if we can build their sense of confidence, if we can build their sense of confidence and their sense of need to be of service, mm -hmm. right? Like our wad is both wanting to be of service to other women like herself as a as an abstract cohort, right? And and also in, in some ways like her her family, right? You call it be a duty or be of service, right? Like I think she wants to, I think she wants to make these people happy. Right. We can park our we can park our prejudice of child marriage aside. <laughs> right. Like I think I think she wants to to be of service to these people, right? Who is caring for her. Um so if if we can start to build a foundation of confidence and self-esteem in in ground that's grounded in the everyday, right? In running the family budget, such as you suggested, Janice, right? Mm -hmm. In in being able to take on a more assertive role within the household in the case of Arwa, right? That she can help her husband make good decisions, right? Now that she's not just, she, she's integral, 
now, right? Mm -hmm. Her thoughts, her opinions, her insights matter, right? Then is that not an essential component to ladder her up to think about the next piece, right? Mm -hmm. I want to carve out X many hours a day to, to do this informal learning. Right. I want to carve out, you know, X many hours a day to meet with a learning group. Right. And to and then to have a compute community component really reinforce um, what each of them are trying to aspire to. All right. Um, so let us let us get to a tighter um, problem statement, shall we? Because I think, because I think our first one was super ambitious, um, and that is great. But I don't know that we can quite get there just yet. <laughs> so let us let us refine our problem statement a little bit. Okay. So um, in the la in the previous statement we had how might we co-create a pathway or uh, um, for, uh, a pathway to informal education for for our stakeholder uh, so don't do we want to make that uh, more specific like the action that we're actually doing is it a program is it a gathering is it a reading club like what do we want to build actually I guess I don't have the the exact answer of the format, but I did get the sense that Arwa wanted that human connection. So I, I feel like whatever the solution is should have some portion of that. Mm. Definitely. So it should be offline, let's say, rather than online, because we, we had this like possibility of making it online last time. And now we know that she prefers it uh, to have this human connection and meeting face to face with others. Mm. And maybe it could be a, a largely in person, like not to say we wouldn't supplement with some resources that she could do in her little free time she has at night or that kind of a thing, because I feel like that's also important too, because it might be tougher for us to provide as much content in person. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So it's starting to sound like a hybrid model. To me, yes, but with like maybe two thirds in person, one third or something like that. Not not quite 50-50, but I don't know. I'm open. What others think? Yeah, I think hybrid makes sense. I, I Maybe it's going back to the question of though she, she seems to desire in-person learning, uh, the amount of time outside of the household might be a limiting factor in terms of just to how many hours or days per week uh, that could really translate into. Um, as far as the, or I guess, is have we defined last time the areas in which she's seeking to learn or progress? So like, we yeah, here, subject matter. Okay, because here I was just I was struck by that statement you were making around, you know, building confidence and self-esteem in the everyday. So, for example, managing the family budget um, and what, you know, might, for example, a math education or economics education look like, but that embedded within like real world projects for her that she's self-defining, but working with a group of uh, other learners on to both check understanding or build understanding while getting kind of a foundational sort of uh, finance education. what do we want the impact to be? Because I also think our, our previous impact was very ambitious. I 
I mean, I sort of get the feeling that we're not quite at the, given her constraints, we're not quite at the stage where it's going to be a money-making opportunity at this point. Like that maybe what we're trying to give her now is a little bit more like Lana was just saying, you know, it's, it's sort of skills that help her gain some self-reliance in her life and some ability, but I don't know. Um, it just seemed like she didn't have many ways to interact. I mean, maybe it could be an online business or something like that, but I guess it seems like to me, if we're laddering, maybe first is just giving her that sense of agency and sort of control over and sort of knowledge about something. And then maybe the next step for her would be an actual money-making thing. Okay. Well, it could be, it could be a two-parter. Um, okay. So then it sounds like the impact is, is some sort of self-reliance, additional handy skill building, right? Useful skill building, right? Um, it's going to be a hybrid model. And for the sake of argument, we'll just do financial literacy, like small business economics. How's that for the subject matter? Um, how, how does that Mohammed, how does that how might we statement read? So how might we build um, a fine um, financial literacy program or a hybrid financial literacy program? Financial literacy. Mm -hmm. For again, we are still talking about the same stakeholders, so. Um, so young, you know, married, well, married, married woman. Refugee woman, yes. Mm -hmm. And then in order to, to um, increase their self-reliance and confidence, hopefully. Yes, given that, that there is uh, limited time for to commit. And um, should we mention something about like, her level of skills now, or, or her um, access to, to the world, maybe? Because it seems like, again, uh, as mentioned before, her uh, world kind of shrunk after, after, after getting married. Yeah, um, I, think, I think let's keep those things in mind as constraints as we brainstorm potential solutions. All right. Okay, so. Um, can you share the new How My We on the screen for everyone to see? Sure. Let me share a different window. And I don't know if it's too much to add this in, but I wonder to your point about exposure, um, I wonder if there's some aspect that could be like exposure to possible career pathways or something, not just the skills, but a little bit of, you know, sort of pre-work around what you could do with this kind of thing. Absolutely. Well, I already know what this program looks like. So I'm gonna leave you guys to 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 think about what what, what the solution looks like here for a few. Um, why don't why don't we break you guys out into into breakout rooms for a sec? We'll do two and three, um, and we'll do we'll do fifteen minutes of um, of just gentle brainstorming, and we'll come back and see what everybody comes back with. 
Sounds good. All right, creating those breakouts now. Ah, thank you, Lana. Is it possible to see the statement in our breakout chat rooms? Because I feel like we can't access the main chat once we go there. Oh, I, I will. Um, I can jump in the the room and uh, send it to, to your chat. Yeah, room just so we we can look back at that if we need to. Sure. Thanks. Sure. Thank you, Mo. Sure thing. Uh, how long do you want the breakouts? How many minutes? Uh, let's do fifteen. Hello. Oh, we lost Janice and Amy. Their breakout. They have sixty seconds to. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. We. I saw the countdown, and when it went to zero, I thought we had to switch over. <laughs> you saw the countdown. You panicked. You're like, I'm coming. Exactly. I'm coming. <laughs> well, I hate it when you're mid sentence and then you get. <laughs> Hello, hello, welcome back. All right, um, let's uh, let's hear what you guys um, what you guys come up with. Ana, do you want to do our team? You feel up to it? Uh, sure, sure. Um, so uh, we talked about a with our financial literacy program, which would, would focus kind of on both household to then solve small businesses, um, really putting an emphasis on case studies. So having a, a flip classroom model uh, where students would uh, do a lot of kind of readings or, or videos um, uh, at home. Uh, they'd have access to a WhatsApp group where they'd also be in uh, conversation with fellow students in the program um, and then would meet, um, you know, likely like weekly. Uh, we talked about having a kind of modular uh, format so that there was maybe some flexibility in terms of some sort of self-paced or clusters of students meeting together based on their sort of availability. Um, but the, the kind of emphasis on uh, the curriculum would be them working through these case studies that in particular would feature um, women entrepreneurs and small business owners um, so that they both see that aspiration uh, and the steps that uh, takes to get there, ideally having some of these um, women as guest speakers, uh, whether in person or virtually on, on Zoom, uh, so they can really ask questions about the journey, not only the skills that they are learning and how uh, those were applied in each of these women's businesses, but also to understand those that ladder, that journey um, that they could take themselves. Um, and then one thing, maybe not more on the aspirational, is it, could the course or program add with a, a capstone project where they're given some a uh, small bit of funding for either self-directed or group project uh, where they actually like work on um, you know, applying some of the business models that they've learned about and into a, a small business and actually have some funds to begin that journey, um, just to give both more confidence to, you know, I'm being entrusted with these funds to um, kind of bring this idea into, into action. Um, Andra Beatrice, 
Do you talk about the LinkedIn sort of like the other groups? Yeah, and so uh, another uh, kind of key component is how to both broaden participants' social networks, but also learn from other, you know, seek out other mentors, seek out other learning or resources. So we talked about both um, making available supplemental sort of resource uh, libraries for them to self-navigate, uh, but to have to have one of the assignments to be to join a relevant like professional associations like LinkedIn group, somewhere where uh, others are having conversations about kind of financial literacy, entrepreneurship, um, that they can become part of that community and network. And so the assignment not only to join like, like such a LinkedIn group, but actually to participate in the forums and conversations. So um, getting building up those skills around networking in those spaces and how to uh, see others uh, within those virtual or local networks as, as resources. Interesting. So I missed the first part of the delivery. Um, the assumption is that this is hybrid. So then they're um, hybrid and modular. So are the modules um, pre-taped essentially? I think that was our assumption about Beatrice and Andra. Uh, if you want to chime in, I, I was thinking, yeah, it was like kind of pre-recorded and pre-written kind of case studies and that then when they're in person they're unpacking them discussing yeah. them seeing how they apply to their own situations or lives yeah okay anything else I mean I think when when we were saying about the flexibility was just this aspect that um, it seems like their time is not their own so for them to commit can be really difficult and so as opposed to somebody just never being able to come that maybe you have a few different times where women can come you know, almost like an office hours kind of thing or maybe you've got a smaller group where it's only two or three of you and you can always align your schedules as opposed to having one time where it ends up certain people just can never make it so that's what we meant sort of about the flexibility we wanted in person but we wanted to have some some means of flexibility around them actually being able to come and still connect with people yeah awesome um amy what did you guys come up with i think janice is getting the doorbell i'm gonna turn off my camera just because of my connection um we talked about so janice raise the point that um, these programs exist, like really great ones already exist. And so what if we did a search and um, learned more about other programs that work really well, learn from them, glean from them, um, and just go through the list of how to handle loans. Um, what do you need to get one? Why do you need to get one? What does debt mean? What's interest? Things like that, sort of like the basics cover, cover those topics and terms, how to be safe, what to watch for. Um, but then we delved into two topics. We talked about generational fa familial learning through you know, um, our, our family members, our grandmothers. Um, and then we also talked about neuroscience actually, like how um, new latest learning practices um, and knowledge and science could be applied or considered in these settings as well. Um, Janice can probably talk more about that. They're just great findings and great books that have been um, published um, relatively recently about the neuroscience of learning and just um, such as um, we learn through emotion, um, testing beforehand actually works um, after learning tra knowledge transfer, like little things like that just to incorporate into the uh, program. Sure, but I'm I'm not sure I I'm not sure I know what your solve looks like. Um, it sounds like you guys want to piggyback off of existing solves. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, Beatrice, I see you raise hand. Yeah, I have a follow up for them if that's okay. <laughs> yeah, please. Um, I really like when you talk about learning through emotions it means like learning in community is what that means to me and like familiar learning and how, you know, in community, we learn everyone's skills a bit, we see them modeled so that ladder becomes maybe more obvious. When we're talking about refugees where can they leverage that familiar um, 
learning because I wonder how their displacement disrupts their access to maybe different generations of expertise. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, in our experience, the family are still generational, right? They're still living in multi-generational households from grandparents down to the grandchildren. Um, I think I think part of the challenge that they have is, is that now they're forced to live in community. If they're in a camp setting, they're forced to live in community with other people that that may or may not be friendly, right? Um, and in um, and if they live in urban settings, then it's a mixed environment of both host community members and um, other refugees or internally displaced people. So then um, the 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 kind of animosity and potential friction is dialed up even a little bit higher. In, in an urban environment. Um, so even though they're still multi-generational households, I think community building starts to be not as um, automatic as it was when they lived in their previous environments. Sure. Um, so I have, um, I have one additional idea to add on. Um, for you guys, for, for these potential, for our potential solutions here. Um, my grandmother had a, um, essentially a lending circle. Her and her friends would get together once a month and they would pool whatever spare money that they had saved, right? She, she saved from her, whatever she didn't spend out of the household. So a little bit of her pocket change and, uh, and then whatever she was willing to put into this lending circle, essentially. And the lending circle wasn't big, probably like eight, 10 of them. And they're all like her besties. And this is created over time. And then somebody in the lending circle would say, oh, my grandson is sick. And, you know, an infusion of cash will be really helpful this month. Right. So then the group decides to lend the money to, to said friend, right? They set the terms of returns and so on and so forth. So in the friendship in the community itself acted as accountability in the payback, right? Because it's a lot of social capital that you're kind of risking if you don't pay your friends back, right? Um, but the burden is also shared because you kind of consciously knew that this money is, is extra, right? You're willing to put into this lending circle, right? So then they would just do this once a month and, uh, and they did it for years and years and years. Um, and, you know, again, I think it's like, what if that was a component to, to, the, to the hybrid solution that Lana and Andrew's team came up with, right? So then they're actually practicing um, some of the principles in which is discussed with a real hardcore like community building component right? And then talk about social capital, right? If the household, if Muhammad's household is short on cash today and Muhammad's wife comes home and says, yeah, my lending circle loaned us the, the extra $200 we needed to bridge X, Y, and Z, right? Then that's a different kind of, it gives her a little different social standing as well. So um, just something to add on to think about. Yeah, we had actually talked about that idea, but what we had just said was that in our case studies, that would maybe be one of the case studies, like one of the models, and then we would try to find different models, like maybe there's, you know, a, a sort of newer age version of something online with, that the women could do together, or something like that. So we we definitely liked that idea, but just sort of thought we wanted to expose them to a variety of options, yeah. and then see what they like. Absolutely, right? And, and I think the exposure in itself is... Um, I think, I think what we learned in the field is that like at some point you have to encourage them to try something, right? Or else it's just, again, we're still in the abstract concepts of like, oh, these are great ideas, but like, how would it work? Yeah, and that's what Lana was saying, like the capstone project was they would pick the model that they liked 
it could be the, the giving circle or it could be yeah. something else or a hybrid that they came up with, like combining exactly. sort of different aspects. Right. Yeah. And I do love that, that, that community building activity or aspect of it. And, and so perhaps like, yeah, capstone really does encourage rather than just being individual, but a real group component, but um, that they're exposed to a number of different kinds of both business models and then as a group are coming to some consensus around, okay, this is why we want to, our, our, our classes sort of funding, um, you know, and now we have a one month or two month or however long that kind of capstone would be uh, to really put that into action. And you could imagine even maybe depending on the size of this program, like a couple of those where maybe people are choosing their own adventure, but as yeah. groups and then could, could really check in with one another. Okay, how's how's the lending circle going for this group? How's, um, you know, this kind of uh, group that's maybe exploring like digital consultancies, you know, happening over here, just to get that kind of feedback and under learn from one another. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so in the chats, let's, um, well, actually, before we do that, um, do I want to do this way? Let's, um, let us change our names to, we all know how to change our name on this thing, right? We're going to rename ourselves. So you're just going to name yourself to three dots like I've done. And Beatrice, if you'll just take off the she and her as well, if you don't mind. Thank you. And John thing. Hi, John. Are you with us? I'm going to rename him as well myself. Nope, he's not with us. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. In the chats. Oh, and Amy is not changed. Amy, I'm going to rename you. Okay. So in the chats, um, if you'll just answer, what kind of assumptions do you think we're making here on, on the proposed solution? That any of it is allowed in their context. You wanna put it in the chat, Janice. I'll put it in the chat. Put it in the chats. I made everybody anonymous. So you can say whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> Can you ask the question again? Yeah, so the the solutions that's proposed, right? Um, hello, screen sharing. Oh, um, what are the assumptions we're making in the solution? It's missing an N, Mohammed. Uh, so in the proposed solution by, by Lana and Andres and Beatrice's team, um, and you're going to put it in the full chat, so not just to me, to everyone in the meeting. Why am I not showing up as that? All of our pictures are going to show up. <laughs> I know. This kind of <laughs> that purpose. <laughs> this, must be, anonymous. <laughs> this must be a new feature.
30 more seconds. Any more assumptions we're making here? Okay, all right. Well, if you can um, take it off of the, thank you. So there's a, a, there's a lot of assumptions we're making here. I think some of it, um, as we surface them, right? Like some of it can get folded into the overall solution design, um, such as making sure that they have internet access and, um, and, a, and some version of a device to access the said, um, said uh, hybrid modules, right? Um, I think those can get designed into it. I think the localization component is a super important one, um, both in language, um, language access, and then also the um, localized examples, right? Um, some of it is a little bit harder that I think basically like an overall motivation, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Motiva motivation and like kind of continued propulsion forward in, in, in keeping it going, right? So, so then the question is what, do, how do we build in new touch points throughout the programming, right? So that, so that you kind of intervene before they kind of poop out um, in the, in the component, right? And then also, is there a way to leverage the community aspect, right? To help the, the motivation and the propulsion. Um, I love this, I love this idea of, um, of also designing a way for them to receive feedback individually and as a whole. Um, whether they have money or not to, to fund the capstone, I think again, that can get designed into the, into the solution itself, right? Um, I do think it's really powerful when when the participants have skin in the game, right? So if we're talking about a lending circle, then, then they need to put some percentage of their own means in. Because if it were the program itself provided the funds for, for to, to play this lending circle component, um, I think the I think the desire to do it well and to being re really responsible steward for it goes down, right? So, so I think having skin in the game is really important. There's numbers of things we can't really control. Are women allowed to engage in financial matters? Um, and, and how supportive their husbands will be, right? So then families become an external stakeholder. Um, is there a way to, to subtly engage them as the overall design? Um, and then I think there's a number of human skills needed, right? From team building, from project management, from self-directed learning, from understanding themselves as learners. Um, and, uh, and just kind of general, general 21st century skills, right? Um, how do you work in a group? How do we, how do we collectively make decisions together? Um, so those are also, they're, they're currently in our assumptions bucket, um, but I would say, I would almost wanna put them under constraints because um, in our experience, not, there's not enough programs out there teaching 21st century human skills and the and the deficit is is really apparent in in our students learning journey
Um, so that is, I feel like that's a good summation of, of assumptions and challenges. Yes, Lana. I was just going to do a, a, just a time check. I don't know if we have a planned sort of break, like a break. I'm just mindful of like, it's three hours on Zoom. So I know, like, I know. Why don't, why don't, why don't we take a eyes for a moment? And yes, why don't yeah. we take um, a five minute break? Is that all right? Yeah, why don't we take a five minute break and we'll come back at 1130 and then we'll shift gear into the last half of this workshop. Thank you. We'll come back at 1135. Yes, 1135, sorry. <laughs> What's for lunch, Janice? Yogurt and granola. Oh, I got that in my fridge for when we're done. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I agree, it's very difficult to eat that and talk at the same time. Yep. All right, well, welcome back everyone. Um, so Beatrice should just be a couple more minutes. Um, so, I think we're going to kind of pause here for the the learning journey and the design thinking component of this of our workshop because I think we got to we went through an iterative process we have some really interesting insights um, from from archetypes right and we got to a decent enough of a solution that I think a few tweaks like could potentially be a small pilot out in the field. Right, so, so that feels pretty good in terms of, you know, what we're able to accomplish in uh, five hours. Um, so we're going to switch gears into the storytelling component of, um, of the second half of, um, of our workshop. Um, I know that as part of this MIT Migration Summit, um, there's, there's been a lot of different storytelling component that has come and gone. Um, so can can we just talk a little bit about why do you guys think storytelling is important? Um, what kind of skills does it facilitate in the learners? And um, and then also how does it why does it matter in the greater ecosystem? I guess I would say two different sides come to mind. So one is sort of dealing with their past um, for refugees in particular um, in terms of, you know, it's sort of a 
like a more projective technique as opposed to saying, tell me about the trauma that you experience. It's a way for them to sort of, you know, tell their story um, a little more productively. And then on the flip side, in terms of proactive go forward skills, it's very important in terms of persuasion. You know, if they're going to try to persuade their husbands, they're going to try to sell their business or get other people to join them. Um, so I think from both sides, it's, it's important. Go liberal arts. Nicole, Glenn, you know, you've both um, have attended a number of sessions throughout the Migration Summit. Um, would love to hear your perspectives on, on this question around storytelling, both within this Migration Summit sort of format, but in education programs kind of more broadly. Um, so I'd love your perspectives if you want to share. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, when we facilitate workshops, I try not to share a lot of my opinions, but. Oh, 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 McCollin, Blend. Oh, McCollin, yes. I'm oh, sorry. 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 Then I will. I will shut up. McCollin, hi. Your turn. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, and firstly, uh, yeah, I would like to thank you all for, you know, taking the the time to be here and then. Uh, throughout this uh, migration summit, has been really phenomenal. Uh, thank you uh, for being here. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, with respect to the question, you know, what's the importance of, you know, what, uh, storytelling? Uh, I mean, the idea is, um, we always say that, you know, the, a picture is more than, more than a thousand words. So for people that, you know, especially in, in, coming in the circumstance for refugees, uh, how could they express what they've been through? So if they have the ability to communicate, uh, to bring you know, their past to life so that they can share what they have been through, um, you know, what obstacles that they face and how they thrive in those environments to be where they are at the moment. So what we're doing is we're sharing that impact. In turn, we are inspiring others that you know, um, are giving up uh, you know, or taking things for granted. For example, you know, you know, uh, comparing a kid who's lived his uh, his life, uh, you know, displaced throughout, and then uh, others who uh, who's surrounded by loved ones and family. If you uh, if you bring a certain challenge to both of them, uh, I would assume that the kid that has uh, gone through a lot of things would actually arise to the occasion, and, and he would be okay through it because he has he has overcome a lot of things. So in a way, what we are doing is if we are uh, giving uh, refugees the ability to share their stories, um, you know, to tell it from, uh, from within where uh, they can really show what they've been through, what they have overcome, then they would be able to inspire others so that they wouldn't give up. And uh, I, I, the notion that's been going on throughout the Migration Summit is that education is the key. So here, if they can show that, and then through education, others could also uh, aspire and reach and um, all their, their full potential. Uh, at least that's from my point of view. All right, thank you. Thank you. Can you introduce yourself? We never had a chance to meet. Uh, yeah, sure, oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Blaine Alam. I'm originally from Eritrea. I currently reside in Ethiopia uh, as a refugee, and I'm also an MIT React alumni. Uh, and through the support of the Mighty Act and the NAMAL program, uh, now I'm at a point in my life where I am able to uh, really, um, really live throughout the, the self-reliance and currently working remotely with organizations as well. All right, thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. All right. Um, anyone else uh, on the refuge on the on the on the power of storytelling, why we do it, how do we do it, um, why does it matter, and, and the kind of skills in which we impart as part of the storytelling muscle. I'm, I'm repeating something from Migration Jam. Um, and so it's, a, it's an organization that is a platform for storytelling. And I, and I think what they said, this is so long ago now, three weeks ago, they said, um, it's about owning the narrative. It's owning the story, changing and change, influencing the message um, and taking control of the message. 
versus you know having it out there for anyone to botch or whatever. Um, so it's control. Yeah, absolutely. Lana, what are your thoughts? I know I'm sure you sat in plenty of sessions throughout the summit. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a couple of things um, just building on what others have already shared, but that I was actually just thinking about what we were talking about earlier in our the designing the program about the need for understanding what are like the small steps in a journey um, and and uh, both the kind of aspirational or how does someone problem solve and to me stories are about our narratives of journeys and how someone encountered challenges or opportunities and navigated choice along the way. Um, and so the more that I hear and that we hold space for other stories for others to hear from others' journeys, like hopefully that is both aspirational for others, helps others um, see them both see themselves but see how other people, problem solved along the way and, and where they have, um, where we all have agency or choice within our lives to, to navigate choice um, in that way. Um, something I find myself really wrestling with is what does it mean to hear a story, to hold a story um, with both great respect, um, compassion, and then what is the, the kind of ethics of action um, from there, you know? And so that, that's, a, I think a big piece that I just, you know, uh, personally is, you know, what does it mean to, for me to receive a story? That's a, that's a great question, right? What are my responsibility now that you have, you have a generously shared, right? Have offered to be vulnerable, right? And and then, as you said so eloquently, what is the ethics of action that follows, right? It's not just how I hold it, but what am I supposed to do with it after that, right? And sometimes it is just the holding, you know, sometimes we can get into our empathetic distress of like, let me try to fix the story you've told me. Yeah. Um, and what does it mean just to hold it with compassion, you know? Um, but yet, you know, if uh, for us in from MIT React and this one that co-organizes the Migration Summit. For us, if we just hear all of these stories, but don't take any, don't help inform what is our future of our programs and, and our kind of actions in terms of this space, that that would be a loss, you know? Um, and that would be to me disrespecting the stories that I've shared here. It's more how to hold, listen, really understand, approach with greater inquiry to then inform, okay, this is how we're going to act into the space. Um, so that to us, this month has been just an incredible learning uh, journey for us in, in thinking about okay, how does that inform um, the kinds of interventions and programs that we can design with others within this space. Absolutely. And, and that makes me, that makes me think of, um, you know, how at the end of um, books, there, there's usually a, a a gratitude section, right? Like the author thanks any numerous of people in which have helped them write and create from their husbands to their agents to their publicists, right? So imagine imagine a scenario in which um, a program was created out of, you know, the deep listening in which the program design lead have gone and done, right? And then there's literally a thank you page naming every participant by name for their insights, right? And then the effort was taken to share back, right? And say, thank you, Arwa, for, you know, the story in which you told me, right? You might not understand what it means to co-create, but, but this, is a, this is a manifestation of it, right? And then to reflect on, on the potential pride that she would feel. Right. Um, it's, it's a lot of extra steps, but I, but it's also not, not an impossible task to do. Um, all right. Anyone else on, uh, on stories and the importance of storytelling? I, 
I just love it from an evolutionary biology standpoint. It's just so instinctively comforting, you know. That Absolutely. Right. And I powerful think powerful medium. I think that goes back to Amy's point about um, control and agency. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think the bigger the the devil's advocate position, right? Or the bigger food for thought is how powerful can stories be when the channels of distribution are inherently biased? Right. When the when the when the public's attention span um, is limited. Right. And and how do we how do we shift that dynamic, right? Or conversely, how do you know when we succeeded in, in, in creating as much narrative diversity as needed in any given ecosystem? Um, and then, uh, Macau, I saw you had your hand up. I'm sorry, I wasn't ignoring you. Mikel? Does he need to unmute? Oh, he's leaving us. All right. Um, so for our last activity, we're, we're going to end a little bit early today, which is great. I'm sure everybody will welcome the 30 plus minutes back to your calendar. Um, one last breakout room, um, two and three again. Um, so it's it's a splitting it's a, it's a sliding door narrative so i'm going to break you guys out into uh into two groups and is everybody familiar with a with a sliding door idea i mean i think generally but just no nope. yeah yeah so it's actually there's actually a movie but um and it literally the, the movie narrative is literally a sliding door gwyneth paltrow misses getting on an elevator and then the the subsequent actions that falls changes the trajectory of her life right so so it's that idea an intervention is introduced um, in our in our parlance right as designers an intervention is introduced and therefore the trajectory of our students and of our participants dramatically changes as a result or maybe not so dramatically right um but that's the idea of so, so before you get to the sliding door moment, there is uh, there's prologue, right? This is the reality as is. Here are the existing challenges. We introduces the intervention, um, and then here is what we witness is post the sliding door moment. Had this not happened, right? We expect this result. Um, it's, it's a pretty simple framework in terms of uh, how to tell how we tell the story. So one group, let's say, um, let's do, let's do Lana and Andra. Lana and Andra is going to pretend to be Arwa. You have experienced this, this solution in which has been proposed. So you're going to write, you're going to tell a story from Arwa's perspective, right? And then um, Janice, Amy, and um, that's not your name. Your name is? Bella, right? Bella? Bella? Yeah, yeah, Bella, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Um, sorry, you're still you're still three dots, so I couldn't tell. Um, so uh, Janice, Amy, and Bella will um, be the practitioners, the practitioners who have implemented the solution. Right, and so you guys are, you guys are essentially pitching to foundation funders of why our intervention is necessary, what is the outcome of the intervention, and if there is no such intervention, this is the expected trajectory in which our wall will end up on. All right, um, we'll do fifteen minutes, and we'll come back and share.
Welcome back. Um, I'm gonna run to the restroom real quick. I'll be right back. What was the name of the movie that she was referencing? The sliding door moment? The sliding door. Yeah, really. <laughs> it's actually really good. Is it? Oh, I'm excited yeah, to see it. It's an old Gwyneth Paltrow from a long while ago. Okay. It really makes you think of all the small moments in life that can totally change your life. You know, like literally, like they said, getting on an elevator, getting off a subway, whatever. That's great. That's very cool. Apologies. Apologies. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, which group wants to go first? Actually, real quick question. What kind of cognitive skills you guys think you guys employed in in the in constructing a story? What do you mean cognitive skills? <laughs> like be more specific. <laughs> Um, your a list and we can choose. <laughs> I do not have a list in front of me. Um, I mean, you mean like empathy and like creativity? I mean, you know, we were trying to think of what would it really be like, but I mean, I, I guess I, I don't, I don't really know what else you're trying to get at. Yeah. Like perspective taking, common yeah. understanding. Right. Um, Sequencing, right? As Andrew and I were talking about writing in bullets, bullets and sub bullets, right? Uh, that kind of rational logic driven sequencing, like this has to have happened first, right? And then these, these, are, these are the sub bullets. Um, command of the language itself, right? Um, and, and I know that the session is in English and that many learners and, and many participants and students who are trying to support are not, um, are not English learners, but, but there's no reason not to, um, not to discount their, their native linguistic capacity, whether it be in Arabic or, um, or Kurdish or anything else, right? So, so that kind of linguistic development um, I think creativity is a huge one. Um, and, and that kind of imaginative capacity, right? Like Arwa has to be able to imagine something better for herself. And as, as case in point of that, of that second set of insights from her, right? She has trouble saying that. Oh, okay. Those were just... I thought it was worthwhile to think about it for a second because because I think with all the conversation around storytelling and the in the essential nature of storytelling and why we tell it and how empowering it is, um, we also don't discuss it in more kind of detail of like the the skills that kind of scaffolds up to being you know, both both the learners learn in the storytelling environment and also that is needed in order to be an effective storyteller. Right. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so which group would like to share first? Yeah, I think I would like to start from our group. Uh, I was with Janice and Amy. So uh, after going through like a couple of ideas and it was all of a sudden, so um i i could say like our um uh, our group uh, came up with the idea of you know we're working with the community uh we're providing them uh, sewing machines so that they could uh, make uh, their livelihood through that and be a bit uh self-reliant uh, self -reliant. so so when uh, we were teaching them uh initially it was uh, theory based so what was happening was that they had a clear idea of what the machine was doing but in case it got broken or some parts were not working 
uh, those resources were not being utilized. So our idea for the founder is that we we bring in a new curriculum, which is a, a practical based. So hence giving them those uh, needed technical skills so that they can fix those resources themselves and actually utilize uh, the sewing machines um, uh, themselves. So this is the, our idea is behind this one. Okay. Um, all right, so then let the other group play, uh, play the foundation for a second. What, what questions do you have for, for this group and their, their pitch of practical solutions in, uh, in solving this in their intervention? Andra, Lana, you guys are foundation officers. <laughs> um, I guess one question is, you know, how have you thought about your future plans and what you're hoping um, to do going forward so that we can kind of know what kind of commitment you're looking for and what the, what the sort of potential is? Um. Yeah, I think uh, initially the idea here is that we, for the, uh, in order to teach them those te technical aspects, we would be sending those resources. But in the long term, what we want to be doing is that we'll try to connect them with the local organizations or local entities within their region so that they can find uh, those resources they need and actually uh, keep on uh, working with their project or their sewing uh, um, adventures. Mm. And so maybe to the foundation, it could be, you know, initially we want to start small, we want to have, you know, two or three machines, we want to be able to technical skills, and then those machines can then be given to other cohorts at a later time, or if this, or if the outcomes of the program are successful, a year down the road, maybe double or triple the, um, the expenditure to be able to broaden it out and, and scale the initiative. Where's the sliding door component? Where's the before and after? Because they had sewing machines to start. Uh, we're saying they didn't. The saying it was, it was just a theoretical program. And then the sliding door is the bringing in the applied. Okay. Capstone or. Okay, and then we're assuming these women, is the program also training the woman how to sew? Yeah, that would, that would be part of it. That was a, a, a definite component and as well as teaching them how to fix the machine in case it was broken. And it's not just, it's not just sewing products, it's mending. Sure. So existing um, material or clothes or whatever to mend versus create. Any other questions from the foundation? I guess just then on like, what's the longer term impact that you wanna see within the participants of that program? A, a couple things, certainly the, the confidence in being able to do things by themselves, you know, um, giving something back to the community more than likely learning certainly how, how to sew, but also in a little mechanical engineering, see, see who within the community finds that interesting and maybe that's a path for some people. Um, okay, great. Um, so let's hear from Arwa. Arwa went through, went through some intervention Yes, so I will play the role of Arwa, and I just realized we we sort of forgot about our foundation component, so I'll try to add that on the on the fly, but jump in, teammates. You're, you're the you're the shiny star that we, you we know, got very we got very into her emotional personal experience. That's all right. Um, um, 
but basically, uh, you know, our, our, um, see, our proposal um, reflects the fact that a lot of women have a story similar to me, which is we were in school and we were very motivated. You know, I, for example, wanted to be, uh, go work at NASA one day, um, but unfortunately, you know, there's realities of life. Um, and so there's a lot of pressure to get married. So I had to get married at a very young age. Um, and I found the, my hopes and aspirations kind of collapsed and my world got very narrow um, in the confines of my own home without too many opportunities to see others or sort of find my own path um, other than the prospect of having children. And I had seen my sister who got married and had four children right away. And now she is overwhelmed and has no time for herself um, and you know is very unhappy um, and depressed. And so um, I was very, very lucky though, in that I, a friend of mine told me about this program that was for women who maybe wanted to try to start a little business and learn something, keep their learning going, even though they weren't in school and they were married. So I signed up for the program and it totally changed my life. Um, what we did was we had a course that um, explain some of the basics of, of how to like keep track of money and how to like think about managing or starting a business. And uh, we got small groups of women together to talk about what we knew how to do and how we might be able to use these new skills. So we developed a very small project initially. We were all very good at handicrafts and things like that. So we developed a project where we started to sell those just locally in the community to make a little bit of money. Um, while we were working on, a, on bigger plans. And as I said, I love science. So I sort of came up with this idea that we could launch some sort of um, kits for kids, which would be science projects that would help them learn. And you could do that either in your home or at schools. Um, and so I was coming up with the different um, the different uh, uh, experiments that kids could do with things, again, because we know how to make handicrafts, things that we could easily put together ourselves, or at least you could do, you could get the, we knew you could get the supplies um, and, you know, and package it maybe with a few other, few other, um, you know, kinds of materials that, that would be available in households or in, in the typical school. We did a small pilot uh, with the local school and um, the teachers loved it. Um, and the kids loved it and it really got them engaged. And again, they could, they could do it in the classroom, but then go home and, you know, do things at home as well. So now we're looking for an opportunity to get some funding to try to produce this at a bigger scale and maybe help us make some introductions to um, other schools that we could um, figure out how to, how to make this into an ongoing business with, we have a little bit of money from our own um, and experience from our own handicraft business. Um, but now we're looking to take things to the next level. I was going places. She's going to be a <laughs> Mongol. She's going to be a mogul before we know it. We, we did. We had to take her out of handicrafts. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a very gendered, uh, trade right for better or for worse it's a very gender well, I think I think Lana was pointing out which I had forgotten that it was in her profile that she liked that yeah well so nice. so how, do, how do we build on existing skills so yes. herself and and her community but then tapping into her interest in STEM and so how do we you know and then thinking about how to future generations um also like nurturing that that STEM education so Absolutely right, and the and the ROI you guys sketched out is 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 broader, is more confident, right? Her 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 world is starting to kind of expand a little bit, right? And and, and she feels a little bit more grown up, if you will, right? From from where we have from that kind of from that second interview, right? So we're starting to kind of close the gap between her first interview. Right. And, and then kind of almost the backward step she took with the second interview because it closed her off a little bit. And then we're back out into this expansion mode. Yeah, well, that is that is kind of the end of my workshop. Um, so thank you all so much for um, for spending the time here with us. And thank you so much for your insight. I hope um, I hope the the user journey was helpful in in trying to you know 
really uh, have a kind of a true case study to dive into um, with a fun little storytelling component and some kind of higher level conversation around why it's important, how we teach it, why is it, why is it essential as part of the core 21st century human skills that um, both Hello Future teaches and, and I know Jay Wall is an advocate for as well. Um, Mohammed has a short little survey for you guys. He'll drop it in the link um, just to let us know how we did and, uh, and what you guys thought. Um, and you guys can you guys can fill it out later. You guys don't have to fill it out right now, but you might just want to grab the link um, now. And uh, and as always, um, you can reach out to me at Hello Future. Um, our URL is hellofuture.io. Um, with any questions, thoughts, um, suggestions, um, we welcome partners and dialogues and uh, and inspirations always. Thank you so much, Charlie, for this, and Mohammed for facilitating this session. Um, I think it was really rich for me, uh, just really anchoring in, you know, these personas and and thinking through a lot of the assumptions that we make and as we design programs like this. And so, from uh, uh, the Migration Summit uh, team perspective, we look forward to sharing out the artifacts that came out of this design workshop to inform others uh, in our community who might be thinking about, or to our point earlier around uh, existing programs. Uh, how do we build upon existing programs within this space and, and make, for me personally, I'm very excited about uh, the what we've sketched out here today and seeing how, you know, we really build on these interventions uh, for communities like Arwa. So thank you all for, for joining us. It was a pleasure, Alana. Thank you so much for having us.